My name's Tony Green. Um, I'm a recovering sysadmin. Um, I'm not entirely sure what I'm recovering from, but at some point I'll figure it out. Um, I've been trying to give a talk at Puppet Conf, Puppet Eyes, for several years, and the fates have conspired against me, so I'd just like to say this is a very special time for me. Thank you all for coming. I really do appreciate it. Um, this is puppetizing the pain out of patching. If you're not here for that, you're in the wrong room. Run now. So, me. Um, I'm from the UK. I am an old, old school sysadmin. Uh, I started on DCOX, OSX, Slackware, um, old versions of Solaris, back when machines weren't, what is it now, insects? Blowflies, the short-lived ones. They were more like kids. Only <laughs> you had to actually really look after these ones, otherwise there'd be consequences. Um, I grew up in the UK, I now live in Australia. Uh, I've worked with Puppet as a tool since before there was a Puppet, um, which really shows how long I've been doing this stuff. Um, I am an operations person. I've done lots of different roles. I've done architecture, I've done service management and engineering, but I'm an ops person. I love ops. And <laughs> probably because I'm extraordinarily ADD. Um, and Puppet has been able to change the way that a lot of operations teams work. Um, I worked in a highly regulated um, finance uh, company for 13 years, and we used Puppet to basically, it, it was the Swiss Army knife that solved most of the problems that we had. So, we are late in the conference. I'm surprised we have so many people here, especially after last night. But I figured rather than waiting until the very end, um, I would do the demo up front, show you what you're all here to see, because this is the boring bit. And if anyone wants to bail after that, feel free. I won't be disappointed. Now, we had some real problems earlier with the screen, but it looks like it's okay. So, I'm on my Puppet Master. I'm gonna have a look at what my infrastructure is doing at the moment. So, rather than actually trying to um, remember all of the commands, I've just popped them into a little shell script so I can run it without typos. Okay, I wanna look at my fleet. I'm using Puppet Query. Show me, from the fact OS patching, the patch windows that I have on the fleet. I can see I have a patch window defined as PDX and I have six nodes in it. I wanna see from OS patching, fact, show me how many updates I have for each node. And you can see there, a bunch of different machines with various levels of updates required. I've got some patching to do. There are no machines at the moment pending a reboot. That's good. So, fleet's in a fairly healthy state, even though it's not patched. And I have one machine that's actually blocked from patching. One machine that can't be patched at the moment, because it's got a flag set. So, don't worry, not expecting you to understand what all of that does right now. So the next step is I'm actually going to run This wonderful task. Where were we without tasks? So all I'm saying here is run the patch server task. I'm going to take out of the inventory anything with a patch window of PDX. As we saw earlier, that should be six servers. Off we go. Now, I'm not going to wait for this entire thing to finish because it does take a little while and it is all running on my laptop, so when you start hearing the fan spin up, um, it's not Yasmin playing with her drone, it's me uh, and my laptop <laughs> struggling. <laughs> She's threatened to fly it at the screen. What I will wait for is just in a second, we should see a couple of quick ones come up. But in essence, this is it, this is the talk. You wanna know how to patch a server with Puppet, you install one module, you run one task, it does it. That's the easy bit. We've seen, surprisingly, there we go, that's what I wanted to show you. So on the box that we knew was blocked, we actually get an exit statement saying, look, you can't patch. Sorry. I'll leave that to, to run now. Okay, 
I started designing the OS patching module about 18 months ago. Uh, I finished up at this uh, this bank in Australia after being there for 13 years. I got the, the nice golden pat on the back and I took six months off and wanted to throw myself back into doing technical work and doing uh, a little bit of programming and learning a few more bits and pieces. Obviously I knew Puppet pretty well at that point and tasks and plans were at least out if not in their quite mature form that they are now. Um, so I wanted to start some work on I'm fixing patching because having run fleets of several thousand different types of machines, I knew patching was a huge problem. It was something that the operations team hated, business hated it, the auditors hated it, and being the person in charge of it, everyone hated me. Now I'm used to that, I'm a sysadmin, but <laughs> I, I wanted it to be for a different reason this time. I wanted it because they know me, not because of what I did. So I came up with some principles and they've guided what the patching module uh, has turned into. Um, so I thought I'd outline them. First thing, as I said, I'm an old, old school Unix guy. I want a tool that does one thing and one thing well. So I don't want it to have all of the bells and whistles. I don't want it to have a thousand different options, but I do want it to be composable. So I want it to be able to hook into things. Now this is a conversation that Nick and I, uh, is Nick here somewhere? Hello, Nick. Um, Something that we agree on. We've approached it very differently. Nick's module for patching is extraordinary. There's some really cool stuff. Uh, and he's baked a lot of stuff into the module to be able to do this. I approach it from a different way of saying, look, this module just does patching. And if you want to do other stuff, as we'll show later, it's pluggable so you can. It's good that we agree on things. The key data is stored on the node. Factor is the backbone to this entire module. And having that data available on the node means that we no longer have people maintaining Excel spreadsheets, running reports, trying to figure out whether something was patched, syncing data backwards and forwards to try and get state. If the data is on the node as a fact and it gets synced back to PuppetDB, we have live data on the node and we have a reporting system based in PuppetDB. Blocked means blocked. I'll come to that in a minute. Automatically updated. So one of the things that we wanted to see, uh, and one of the things I think is important, is we're not, there is nothing in the module that configures your patching. You say what YUM servers, app servers, WSUS servers you want to talk to. And the nodes will look at them and say, these are the updates I have. These are the updates that are available to me. When you release new updates in, there's a scheduled job that runs, picks up those new updates, turns them into facts and reports back to Puppet what those updates are. That means you can see across your fleet very shortly after you release any new updates where they're appropriate, where they're needed to be added. And if you haven't released patches yet, they don't show up. So it's a very good way of having control. Once you release a patch, you can see everywhere it's needed talked about this with, with Factor, but having that sing, single centralized interface for reporting was critical. I needed to be able to help the guys that were doing work um, out of our offshore offices and some of the junior guys who were responsible for doing some of the manual patching to be able to get data out. They needed a common format. And again, we've got a common format for the patching state. And again, thanks to the work done on, uh, on tasks, you can get that data out of the console as well in a reportable way. So that helped. And also, orchestration was key. One of the things that we talked about at the Birds of a Feather table yesterday was uh, somebody raised a question uh, around how do I make, I can't remember the exact question, but it was basically who's responsible for patching my box? And I said, who owns the box? Who is accountable for making sure that box is patched? Because whoever that is, if that's you as a sysadmin, it's your box, you're responsible for it. If it's an app team, then the app team are accountable in your organization to maintain that, if that's the case. If so, they need to be able to actually go in and patch the machines. They need to be able to go in and say, I don't want it patched. But they, they carry the responsibilities of that. If there's fallout from it, they carry it. But you need to make it easy. And again, the API gives us the opportunity to be able to schedule that stuff, but also now with um, command line actions through tasks and through the console, 
all of that can be done, and it doesn't matter whether or not you're patching Windows, Linux, others to come. Um, it's all done in the same way with effectively the same arguments. There's a couple of customized op options for different um, OS versions, but the core platform is the same. Why? Haven't we got better things to do than patching? <laughs> I mean, seriously, we, we, I've had no, it, it, this seems to be almost patching conf. There's been so many talks and <laughs> the, the, the birds of a feather table yesterday was packed. I can see by the fact that, you know, we have so many empty chairs in here that no one's really interested in solving this problem. Why haven't we solved it? And the fact is we have solved it in little pieces everywhere. And my concern is that, yes, you can roll out satellite and you can roll out SCCM or Skull or any of these other tools. And I think somebody mentioned yesterday, the, is, there, is there one for Ubuntu? I've no idea. But <laughs> you can roll all of those out, but then if you're an ops team or you're an auditor, you're stuffed because you need to then go and interface with six different systems to try and pull state back. And they'll do it in a slightly different way and report it differently. And then if you actually want to go and address that, again, it all works differently. One of the key things with this tool was come up with a way that you're going to represent that data irrespective of the OS in a common format so that everyone can get at the data. Doesn't matter whether you're Windows, Linux, or anything else, you get the same information. So effectively, I was saying to patching, I'm going to replace you with a small shell script. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was tasks, and I had to use Ruby. So it's not a small shell script, it's a large Ruby script, but never mind. But to be honest, the real reason I did it is that. Jake um, is a number of people, one of a number of people that's helped um, work on the module. He actually took it and added in uh, SUSE support. And he sent me this on Slack, and I, I did check with him whether or not I could publish it. Um, and he said, you know, historically it was taking four or five people to patch 500 servers over about five hours. They now do it with one person in about 25 minutes. Now, we've rolled this, this module out. It's an open source module, but I've done a little bit of custom development work uh, for a couple of financial institutions in, um, in Australia. And they're using it, again, very similar situation. Um, they're using it to patch thousands of machines a week, um, completely automated. However, to me, whilst that's good, it's not the real value. The real value is absolutely the reporting and the control that you get with that reporting. So factor is underlying. I mentioned this earlier in a, in a meeting that I, I think factor's worth the price of PE alone. If it was a paid product, I think it's one of the most useful tools I've ever come across. So an example of the facts that we get. Is that clear at the back? Can you make it out? I'll dive into it in a bit more detail anyway later. But it's examples of what we get in the facts. So we have a list of what packages need to be updated and then account of them to make it easy. Where available, it will also break out which of those packages are security related. So certain operating systems, predominantly CentOS, don't report that. However, if you've got RHEL or Debian, Ubuntu, Windows, it will break out between security patching and non-security patching. Why is that important? It's really for me to be able to say, okay, as an account team, where your auditor has said, you must not have any security vulnerabilities. So if you've got 15 patches to apply, and they're all because of typos in the man page for Ngroff or something, you don't care. If there's an SSL vulnerability, you do. So you can just track against number of security updates to be applied. We have a pin package list. I noticed on the, uh, on the board downstairs, somebody mentioned that. Pin packages has always been a, a real problem for me. In Puppet, when you say, Okay, I want to install a certain version of a package. That's great, it does exactly what you tell it to. However, when you patch, the machine gets brought up to date, all new patches get applied, Puppet runs, and it goes, well, hey, hold on a second, you're not running the right version, and then tries to downgrade it. This will point out any pin packages that you have, and as we'll show you a little, more, a little later, it will also say, hold on, you've got packages in your catalog that are version locked that are not pinned and it will create a warning, and you have that option of saying, if there are warnings, don't patch. We'll come to that again later. Um, what else we got? Last run state. So just a, a high level view of the last time the patching ran. Your patch window, some information about 
uh, what you want to do with reboots. And then we have uh, a little area called reboots itself, which shows whether or not a reboot is required, if there are apps that need restarting, even if a reboot isn't required. And again, we'll talk about this later. Whether or not we should block on warnings, if there are any warnings, if we're blocked, and what the reasons are for being blocked. That's the key of all of the, the patching, all of the facts. A lot of the information there um, is generated dynamically, but some of it is actually cached because things like running YUM update or apt check update can take some time. And the first few versions of this, when we did it, we were destroying the YUM servers fairly significantly. So we, we started caching it. And it's a controllable period when it caches. And by default, on Unix, it puts it into like var cache OS it's patching. And it just creates a bunch of files. Now, should you want to, you could just manage those files manually. There is a manifest to manage them if you want, but you don't have to use the manifest. They all just contain text. There's nothing clever in there. The updates are just one per line. So again, on the box, you can tell fairly easily what's happening, even if you don't want to use factor. So all of those parameters, for the most part, especially things like blackout windows, uh, can all be set using the standard. They're just parameters to a manifest. So I'm going to walk through just how the options of setting the patch window, but it's no different if you want to set any of the others. By default, I use Hira. It's nice and easy. It gives you a lot of control so that you can say, look, by default, you're in week one, but you can add anything in. Now, that patching window is arbitrary. It's just a string. So you can make that as long and as complex as you want that makes sense to your team. So you can put times in there. You can put uh, account team names, anything like that, as long as it makes sense to the people that are uh, running it or it's some sort of programmatic term. It doesn't really matter. If you're allowing people to do potentially self-service patching, you can also do it through the ENC. Maybe that's a bit more user-friendly for, for your app teams who might want to configure it themselves. So you just have that as a, um, add that variable into the data of the node group in question, and you can patch that way. Once you've run it, you're on the, uh, once uh, the puppet agent runs, it changes the content of the file, and we have our new fact. Oh, this patching window is now set to week one. So I hope that none of that seems like rocket science, because if it is, the rest of the talk is going to go really badly. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what I meant by fact to drives everything. The, the canonical data for the patching is on the box. You cannot now, you know, whatever anyone else thinks, that box thinks it's in week one. So it's, it's core that because the patching action and the task happens on the machine, it's really important that the machine has the most current data. Blackouts are a similar thing, but they're a, a hash. So you can have a bunch of different ones in there. I have a test one, I have puppetize, and I have an end of year change freeze. Now, again, because these can be stored in Hira, they can be set at different levels and they can be set for different things. You may have an end of year change freeze for, in my case, Australia, over a certain period, but then any machines that might be in, uh, in Hong Kong may have Chinese New Year listed as well, but the Sydney ones may not. So it gives you flexibility, and again, these can be set through the ENC as well, so you give flexibility to your users, whoever they might be. The blackouts expire automatically, so the moment it ticks past that time, which is in, as you can tell, it's in an 8601 format, the moment it ticks past that time, patching's available again. So it, it really is very dynamic. You can set up 12, 18 months worth of, of blackout windows. And if somebody's scheduled to patch and then they go, oh, God, I can't patch, I can't patch, it's really easy for them to hit the ENC, add another window in there, as long as they're you know, a few minutes ahead of when the patching's going to happen, it's going to block it. So what reasons do we actually block in general? Predominantly, blackout windows. That's the obvious one. That's what they're there for. Also, if there's an invalid entry in the, block, in the blackout window. So if somebody's put some data in there that's just wrong, start time's greater than the end time, there's stuff in a manifest to check that. But if you manually hack the file or something like that, if there's anything in there that's invalid, it just says, whoa, safety first, do no harm. I'm not going to patch. Also, there is a configuration option that says if there is anything listed as a warning, which we'll cover in a minute, do not patch either. And that really is a risk appetite thing. Some of the warning stuff, 
can be dangerous, some of it might not be, you know the environment, but we wanted to give a little bit of flexibility there. Now, you remember from one of the principles we said blocked means blocked, and it does. The, the amount of people that have said, can I just have an override, please? And I'm like, you do have an override. You can log onto the box and type yum upgrade because we are not giving you the ability to patch if you said you don't want to patch. And it's not you shall not pass, it's you cannot pass. <laughs> I was in New Zealand not long ago, so I'm on a bit of a Lord of the Rings kick at the moment. <laughs> Oh, do you know, you know Weta Workshop? Do you know what Weta is? It's a, it's a cricket that's about that big, and it's Maori for horrible creature. It's, they're awesome. Okay, <laughs> sorry, complete side note. Um, mentioned warnings. Okay, a couple of the warnings that we, we're in there and some get added, but we mentioned before, if you've got package resources that are version locked, um, sorry, with versions, but they're not locked at the OS layer, we flag that as a warning. Personally, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna change that over to actual a, a blocker because it can break things. Um, but also if the metadata, so your cache files haven't been updated or if they don't exist. The security only patching, I think is yeah, a real benefit. Um, and it works really nicely. So you can see here, I'm on an Ubuntu server. I look at the, the patch count and it says I've got 109 machines to, uh, sorry, 109 packages in total. 48 of them are security related. I run the patching and then, sorry, it, sh it shows me there a list of what those security patches, um, security updates are. Run the task, slightly truncated, saying security only equals true, and then rerun factor, zero updates for security, 61 non-security related. So for, for environments like banks and stuff where they are really concerned with just security patches or where they're looking at, look, we only want to do zero day stuff or you know, stuff that's critical, the ability to patch just on security patches is, is really important. <sighs> okay, rebooting. Now, I want to make this very clear. You should reboot after every patch run. Anyone disagree with that? Good. However, <laughs> there are certain organizations that do not always believe that to be the case. And to be honest, there are times when you don't actually have to. So as an example, I showed you the, uh, the reboot fact earlier. We can see it here now, a bit more detail. So we're saying here, yeah, under reboots, it says reboot required is true. So what that means is, and um, it was talked about yesterday by Nick, but each operating system has its own little functionality to say, look, I need to be rebooted, and we use that. So it's needs restarting, or the var run entry in Ubuntu, or there's a command you can run in, in Windows. It also lists a bunch of apps that need restarting. So what's that sa what that's saying is those apps are actually using libraries or binaries that have been patched, but those apps have not been restarted since then. So it is not uncommon if you're patching to actually not need a reboot, but to need to restart the apps. So again, we make it clear to the account teams to say, if you don't want to reboot, that's fine, but this is the risk you're carrying because if you think you've fixed your security problems and you haven't restarted, you've got a problem. Yeah, sometimes they don't want to restart at the time of patching, they may say, look, you get your patching out of the way, then we're gonna do an application release, and then we're gonna do it. And that's fine, that's, it's their machine. I wanna help them do what they wanna do. We give them solid advice, but it's their machine at the end of the day. For rebooting, we have a few options. We say always. Now, always doesn't mean when it's patched. That means whenever the task is run, irrespective of what's happened. So even if there were no patches to apply, still reboot the box. They wanted it, that wasn't my idea to add that in there. Never, same thing, it's just never do it. And then we have patched and smart. So patch says, if I've been patched, reboot the machine. Smart is just go ahead and check whether or not I need to be rebooted. There is a very long, um, flowchart that actually goes through all of those details. It's on that link. Um, 
it's not that complicated when you go into it. It really just says, look, there's, there's two options. There's a general option that you supply to the task to say, I want to reboot everything. And then each node can have a reboot override to say, I don't want to be rebooted. Integrations. This is what I was talking about with uh, and the stuff that Nick's done. Here, what I'm doing is actually using my health check module. So I've got another module on the Forge that does health checks on Puppet itself, not on the machine, but is my Puppet agent running? Is it doing the right things? Has it run recently? I want to know that because the canonical data for the patching control is on the node. So if it hasn't run recently, I don't need to know about it. So this, again, using a plan, goes onto the, it goes onto the list of the machines you provide, runs the health check. If it comes back clean, adds it to the list for patching. If it comes back not clean, doesn't get patched. And this is just one example. You can feed this into any, any plan you want. There's a bunch of sample queries, which I'll come back to in a sec, because I know we're running a little short on time. Uh, so I'll do that when I jump back over to the, uh, the command line. In terms of a roadmap, I am looking at agentless patching through Bolt. However, whilst it's, it's not hard to do, it loses a lot of what I think the advantage of this product is, which is all of the reporting. So the, the fact is this, you know, the patching, as we said before, it's not hard. You run, log on the box, you run a command. And I like the fact that the control is there wrapped around it, but we're going to offer it. Um, I see an awful lot of purple t-shirts in here, so I think some people know about this tool called Chocolatey. Um, I had a chat with them earlier, uh, yesterday, and we're going to look at actually uh, adapting uh, chocolate, up, chocolate updates into, into this as well. Um, Puppet Remediate, uh, I think we'll, we'll effectively just plug in because you can use tasks to do it and we have a task. Um, I've been very slack. I have a pull request in from uh, Remain to add BSD support, um, which is fantastic and I haven't been able to actually get to that. Um, a friend of mine is working on AIX integration. If you need Smile Dylan, you know who that is. Um, and I'm looking at Solaris 11. I'm not touching 8, 9, and 10 ever again, hopefully, but um, <laughs> possibly gems. And look, whatever else might come up. I don't, I'm open to options. In terms of thanks, specific thanks go out to a, a person who we will call Not Potato. He knows who he is. Um, and some very familiar names up there for, for most of you. Um, Brett gave me a good kick to, to get started. Uh, Rob, is Rob in here somewhere? I don't know, no. But he was crazy at just giving me a boatload of uh, feedback and pointing out all places where it was broken, which was fantastic. Uh, Tommy's around somewhere as well. Um, Jeff Williams, uh, speaking of Lord of the Rings, our little hobbit friend from the UK, um, or Australia now, um, helped me out with all of the testing and pointed out what an abysmal Ruby developer I am, which I'm so thankful for. Um, <laughs> Jake added in the, uh, the SUSE support, and Nathan added in the uh, support for Windows. A very special fat thanks, though. Yasmin. <laughs> Without the work Yasmin did, and obviously her team, but none of this would work. It was the, the perfect merging of declarative control of facts and then of imperative workflows. It's to me the, the prime example of how the three pro the systems can work together in such a simple and effective way. Um, that's me. If anyone wants to know the uh, origin of an albatross flavor and you don't watch Monty Python, I can encourage you to watch Live at the Hollywood Bowl. It's seabird flavor, that's what it is. Um, it is quarter past, so I know we're actually uh, finishing up now, but I'm probably available for the next 15 minutes until I fall into a small coma and then probably wake up back in uh, Australia. So if anyone's got any questions or anything else, feel free to, to grab me afterwards. And seriously, thank you so much for coming along. It's been great.